Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net, and become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month by going to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of The Adventures of the Falcon. The original air date is April 8th, 1951, and the title is The Case of the Carved Ham. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Alice. I'm glad you called. Oh, you'll have to count me out tonight, Angel. I'm all jammed up. Mm-hmm. Some friend of mine just signed the temperance pledge. But with the people he knows, even without alcohol, he still may wind up half shot. This is Ed Hurley, friends, inviting you to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Carved Ham. And now, The Case of the Carved Ham. It is early Sunday afternoon in New York. And a lovely redhead named Doris Webster gets off the Fifth Avenue bus at 76th Street. As she does, she notices a tall, thin man behind her. He's still behind her at 78th. At 81st, Doris gets a little frightened at the game and stops dead in her tracks. Whereupon her shadow almost topples over her. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, lady. I should have looked where I was going. That's the trouble. You did. How's that? You've been following me for the last hour. Me? Listen, mister. I don't know what your game is. I'm sightseeing. Well, do it elsewhere. Or I'll call the police. You don't really mean that, baby. Officer! Oh, I guess you do. You want me, lady? Yeah, please. I guess that's my cue to beat it. Been nice knowing you, honey. We must do this more often. Four, one, one, seven... One. Hello? Is that you, Stuart? Yeah. It's Doris. I, I got to see you. Why? What's the trouble? Well, I I, I just had a funny experience. I, I, I thought a man was following me. Was he? Well, he might have been only trying to pick me up. At least that's what he claimed. Well, don't worry about it, Doris. You come on over. All right, honey. I'll be there in 20 minutes. You uh, through with the phone, lady? You. Oh, hi, you beautiful. Imagine bumping into you here. Certainly is a small world. Don't tell me it was a coincidence, Stuart, because it wasn't. I tell you, he was following me. That's ridiculous, Doris. Why should he? Well, maybe he's working for Santos. Never in a million years. If your boyfriend, Mr. Santos, knew about me, we would have heard from him long before this. Listen, listen, Stuart. If, if anything should happen... Oh, now, you're, you're talking like a child, Doris. I know, I know, but, well, if anything should... Look, there, there's a red leather vanity bench in my bedroom. Vanity bench? Yeah, yeah, you can't miss it. It's uh, 24 inches high and about 18 inches wide. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you turn it upside down, you'll see the padding comes out. Inside, you'll find some newspaper clippings. I want you to send those clips to the police. Forget it, darling. Nothing's going to happen. Want to bet? <gasps> Who the devil are you? It's a man I've been telling you about. The name is Brian King, honey. What do you want? You. What? Yeah. The fellow I work for would like to see you. Oh. Joe Santos? Do it! You can tell Mr. Santos I'm not interested. Maybe you better tell him yourself. 
Let's go, chum. Take your hands off him. Come on, handsome. I told him you were practically on your way over. Now, you don't want to make a liar out of me, do you? Look out, Stuart. Oh. You were a little late, honey. Stuart. Now, don't give him a second thought, baby. <laughs> You'll be all right. <laughs> How about a drink, Brian? Don't mind if I do, Sanders. Now, that boy Stewart's no lightweight. Bet I lost five pounds lugging him over here. Thanks. Mm. Still out cold. What do you do for a living? He's an actor. Goes under the name of Stuart Van Dyne. I wonder what Doris sees in him. Uh, he's a pretty good-looking guy. Yeah. He'll make much better appearance than Santos, huh? <laughs> well, you can't have everything, Sanders. After all, you've got the money and the muscles. And don't forget the brain, Brian. Well, you can't prove that by me. What do you mean? I came up here from Kansas City because I heard that you were going to be the biggest operator of gambling joints in New York. So? So, ever since I got here, all you seem to be interested in is that girl Doris Webster and the schmo she's been seeing on the side. By me, that ain't tending to business. Just let me take care of oh. Mr. Stuart Van Dyne, oh. of course. There's your chance. He's coming oh. too now. Oh. Hello, Palsy. How you feel? Who are you? Joe Santos. Oh. You hear me, huh? Uh, you never should play around with my girl, Stuart. Well, what are you going to do to me? Well, Brian here thinks Doris likes you because you're a good-looking fellow. Well? Well, we fix it so you ain't so good-looking no more. Huh? Mess up that face, Brian, but good. No. Shut up. Oh. oh. Go on, Brian. You're crazy. What's the matter? Don't they tell you in Kansas City that anybody who works for Santos follows orders? Not that kind, I don't. Vince! Vince! What's the matter, boss? I don't think Mr. King wants to play on our team. Oh, is that so? Wait a minute, Santos. Well? Come here, Stuart. Okay. Oh, no! <laughs> I, uh, I'm looking for a Michael Waring, the Falcon. Come in. My name is Webster, Doris Webster. Sit down, Miss Webster. Thanks. Now, what's the problem? Well, uh, a very dear friend of mine has been kidnapped. What's his dear friend's name? Stuart Van Dyne. Did you report it to the police? No. Why not? Because I don't want them involved. You don't want them involved? A man is kidnapped? I didn't say he was kidnapped. I said he disappeared. You said nothing of the sort. I can see I made a big mistake in coming here. Oh, I don't know. Well, I do. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Mr. Waring. Believe me, it won't happen again. All right, all right. <gasps> Hello, Doris. What do you want? Mr. Santos sent me around to find out whether beauty was only skin deep. Where's Stuart? Where is he? All right, Vince. Here we are, right on cue. Come on, pretty boy. Doris, I... I can't what? look at him! Take him away! Take him away! <laughs> Who is it? It's Emily Bryan. Open up. Just a second, Emily. All right, get in here. What's the matter, Brian? Who says anything's the matter? Oh, well, you're packing. That's right. We're taking the 1035 back to Kansas City. Why? Because that guy Santos I came here to work for is nuts. What happened? Never mind, Emily. Just take my word for it. He's out of his mind. Well, who would that be? Oh, it's the billboy, honey. I asked him to bring up a package for me. Oh. I'll let him in. No, you get started packing. I'll take care of it. Just a second. All right, son, let's... Oh. Hiya, Sergeant. Well, it's about time, Mr. Waring. I hope I haven't inconvenienced you. As a matter of fact, you have. What's on your mind, Corbett? Sit down and have a cup of coffee. 
you read about a guy named Brian King being gunned yesterday in his hotel? Yeah, I understand they're holding his wife. She didn't do it, Mike. Uh-huh. You've got to look out for her interests. Has she asked me? No, she don't know a soul in New York. But whose idea is this? Mine. Yours? <laughs> now, I've heard everything. What's your interest in this? What's her name? Emily. Emily King. How come you're so concerned about it? I her? just feel sorry for the dame. You sure that's all? Look, can't a guy do a decent thing in his life without everyone being suspicious? All depends on who the guy is. Who does Mrs. King say killed her husband? She don't know. She was in the bedroom packing when Brian got it. What were they doing in New York? Her husband came here to work for Joe Santos. Maybe it didn't pan out because he was in an awful hurry to leave. Did you speak to Santos? Yeah, he denies the whole thing. Claims King was doing fine. And I suppose he has an alibi for the time of the murder. Mm. What do you think? I think if I'm going to prove my unknown client didn't kill her husband, I'd better get started finding the party who did. I'll be seeing you, Sergeant. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. An hour has passed since Mike Waring, acting at the behest of Sergeant Corbett, undertook to do some private detecting for Emily King. Now, as we find the falcon, he is making like a private eye. Oh, no, don't tell me. Yes, it's me, Santos. Or should I say I? Anything you say, Mikey, is okay with me. Mm -hmm. Sit down. Thanks. Would you like something to drink, maybe? Maybe. Scott's fine. You, uh... Think you're going to be able to do something for that little girl? What little girl? Brian's wife. How did you know I was working for her? I got ways. Look, Mike, if she needs money, let me know. (laughs) Where's your white beard, Santos? Don't get me wrong, Mike. I give nothing away. You ever stop to think that the party who killed Brian maybe was trying to kill me? You kidding? Didn't the cops tell you the hotel suite Brian was using was registered in my name? No. Well, it was. I turned it over to Mr. and Mrs. King because they have no place to live in New York. What kind of work did Brian do for you? Oh, little this, little that. Well, that tells me... What's the matter? That picture on the piano. What about it? I think I recognize the lady. Isn't her name Doris Webster? Yeah. <laughs> Certainly it's a small world. Where do you know Doris from? Oh, she was up to see me yesterday. About what? Oh, no, Santos, don't tell me you're jealous. I asked you a question, Mike. I suppose you answer one of mine first. Was Doris running around with Brian King? No. Well, I've only got your word. Who's in the next room? Nobody. Don't give me that. I heard something in there. You're crazy. I assure you. See? It's Look out, Santa! <laughs> Angel. Well, if it isn't Mr. Waring. Well, Don, if it isn't. <laughs> it's like I just mentioned to a friend. It certainly is a small world. Yeah. Too small. <laughs> uh, say, that must be a dihedral. Huh? That's the molten joint that's attached to the Finnegan pen. Here, let me show you. Hey, wait a minute. All right, if you don't want your car started. You think you can? Angel, I'm the greatest little Mr. Fix-It in the business. Move over. Well, if I... Now, if I'm not mistaken, there should be a loose wire under the dash. Mm-hmm. What did I tell you? It's been cut. Exactly. But if we wind the ends together like so, then... Who cut those wires? Me. What was the idea? Well, it was the only way I could think of to arrange this interview. How about a drive around Central Park? Hmm? Get out. Oh, you're not going to make me do that beautiful after all the trouble I went to? Do you want me to call a cop? Well, that's entirely up to you, Doris. But I don't think Joe Santos would approve. Well, if Santos ever finds you talking to me... No, I don't think there's any danger of that. At least for a couple of hours. Or haven't you heard? He was shot at 2.30 this afternoon. You're lying. Well, there's no reason to be upset, Angel. The bullet just tore a chunk out of his side. Listen, Waring, what do you want? The murderer of Brian King. I don't know anything about it. I suppose you let me be the judge of that. Now, when was the last time you saw Brian King alive? Yesterday, when he brought Stuart... Mm-hmm. Now we're getting to it. Sue, it's the boy you told me was kidnapped. I didn't say he was kidnapped. Oh, please, let's not start that again. I gather Mr. Van Dyne has finally turned up, huh? Yeah. And Brian King was the one who located him. That's one way to put it. 
What's the connection between you and Stuart? We used to be kind of friendly. What stopped you? Santa's found out about us through Brian King. Oh, so that's the connection. And what did the messages King and uh, Santos do to Stuart? I... I have no idea. Well, suppose you give me Stuart's address and let me find out for myself. You sure this is the right place, Mike? Well, Doris told me Stuart Van Dyne was living in apartment 4E, Sergeant. Guess he's out. Are you surprised? I don't follow you. Mr. Santos is inclined to be a little on the possessive side. What do you think would happen to anyone who he caught playing around with Doris? Well, mm-hmm. where are your keys? I don't like to do this. Whose idea was it for me to get messed up in this business? Who asked me to try and help Emily okay, King? Okay, okay. This one ought to do it. Yeah. Uh, awful dark in here. Light switch ought to be somewhere Keep near... Keep your hands off that switch. What? I've the... got enough light from the hallway. Oh, no, that's not fair, chum. You can see us and we can't see you. That's tough. But just to make things easier for you, I'll tell you I've got a gun in my hand. You, Stuart Van Dyne. What's it to you? Well, a thought just occurred to me, Stuart, that uh, you'd be no better off than we are if I were to... Shut the door, boy, you! Hit the light, Sergeant. I'm warning you! Put him out. Uh, it's too late, friend. No wonder he was sitting alone in the dark. Yeah. Who did that to your face? None of your business. It was Brian King, wasn't it? What if it was? It might explain a lot of things, such as finding you alive and him dead. What did Dora say when she saw you? I'll take care of her, too. Well, you took care of Brian King? Suppose you start answering some of my questions for a change. How did you guys get in here? Simple. Sergeant has a set of skeleton keys. Let's have them. Now, let, let me have, have them, Sergeant. Or would you sooner I took them off your body? I think he means that, Corbett. Okay. Nope. Just drop them on that bureau. I'll pick them up from there. Now, let's see how fast you boys can get to the other side of the room. Come on, hurry up. You're making a mistake, Stuart. Let me worry about that. Where are you going? Out. You're not going to lock us in here. You know, Sergeant, you ought to make a great detective. That's as good a piece of deduction as I've heard in years. You're coming on that door, Sergeant. Ain't made a dent in it yet. Well, save your knuckles. The squad car will be here in a minute. Were you able to get Doris Webster on the phone? No, oh, her line has been busy. I'll try her again. Okay. You don't think Van Dyne could have gotten to her yet? No, not a chance. When I get my hands on that guy. Hello. Hello, that you, Doris? Who's this? Mike Waring. Oh. Hey, Stewart's looking for you. Hope you got a good, strong lock on your door. You're not frightening me. I didn't intend to. That's Joe Santos's department. And Mr. Santos doesn't worry me either. Little Doris can look after herself. You know, it's a funny thing, Doris, but the last time I heard someone say that, the undertaker was around in short order. I hope you have better luck. <laughs> He's me, Doris. Santos? Yeah. Okay, honey, just a second. Come on in, honey. Thanks. Oh, I, I thought you'd be in bed. You mean that bullet? Oh, nothing. Oh, I'll bet it hurt something awful. Here, come on, sit down, honey. I tell you, he's nothing, Doris. You're angry with me, aren't you? Why, I got reason. Oh, I give you my word, honey. That Stuart character didn't mean a thing. You know there's only one man in the world for me. Sure. Oh, come on, honey. Say you forgive me. And if I do? I promise I'll never look at another man again. Until the next time, huh? What do you want me to do? Crawl on my knees? It might be a good idea. Listen, you creep. Who do you think you're talking to, anyway? What's the matter, Doris? You fed up? You're darn right I am. Did you ever get a good look at yourself in a mirror? Oh, I know Santos is not so good looking. (laughs) That's putting it mildly. Sure, I went with Stuart, and there were other guys, too. And there will be again. I wouldn't bet on that. Yeah? Well, I would. You're not afraid of what this actor fellow's story is going to have to say? No. The police will take care of him. 
Why should they? Because well, he killed Brian King. Why should he? Because of what King did to his face. You're forgetting something, Doris. I tell King to do this thing. Well, he took a shot at you, too, didn't he? No. That was one of my boys. What? Yeah, Vince. You remember him? Nice, tall fellow. I don't understand. Sure you do, Doris. You are a very smart girl. You killed Brian? That's right. You're crazy. I can't be if the cops think Stuart did it. Of course, you could tell them now. Listen, listen, Sandy, I, I swear I wouldn't give you away. Wouldn't you? No, no, if, if I wanted to squeal, there are plenty of other things I know. Come here, baby. Oh, darling, you gotta believe me. Honey, I'll never open my mouth. Yes, I believe <laughs> Wait a minute, Sergeant. I think that's the apartment. Is there a nameplate? Yeah. Uh-huh. Doris Webster. Yeah, what are you waiting for? I got a hunch she ain't gonna answer. I wouldn't be surprised if you're right. Well, shall we? By all means. Uh-uh. Take a look at what's hanging from the chandelier. Well, that's one way to get up in the world. Good three feet, I'd say. Might as well have been a mile. All right, let's get it down. Well, that's life for you. But I wonder why she did it. Did what, Sergeant? Commit suicide. Who says it's suicide? I do. You see any sign of a note around? What makes you think there has to be a note every time? The girl was scared. Yeah, so she put a rope around her neck and hung herself. Won't be the first time it happened. No, it doesn't make sense, Sergeant. Take a look at that red leather vanity bench. Yeah, what about it? Can't you see it's been torn apart? Look at the condition of the living room. What does that prove? Well, if Doris committed suicide, who took the joint apart? She might have herself. Why? How should I know? Well, maybe I can guess. Doris seemed awfully sure that she could keep Joe Santos in line. Now, how could she do that? I don't know. Well, the obvious answer is that she must have been holding something over his head. I suppose it was hidden in that vanity bench. Why would it have to be in there? It didn't. The point is, wherever it was, Santos must have found it and destroyed it. Well, assuming for the sake of argument he did, I don't see how that makes us any better off. Well, no, frankly, I don't either, Sergeant. But I'm grasping at straws. Let's hope one of them is enough to break Santos' neck. <laughs> Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. An hour has passed since Mike and Sergeant Corbett discovered the body of Doris Webster hanging in her apartment. And now, as we find the aforementioned gentleman, they're breaking the news to Joe Santos, who, surprisingly enough, doesn't seem in the least bit disturbed. Well, what are you going to do? That's life. You seem to be taking it pretty much in your stride, Santos. You expect me to cut my throat? You may want to with that. Because I've got a theory you killed, Doris. You got a theory. You're out of your mind, Mike. I haven't been out of this bed since I was shot. How do you account for those scratches on your face? When I saw you earlier today, there wasn't a mark on you. And don't tell us you cut yourself shaving. Say, Sergeant. Yeah? Has the report come through on the substance under Doris's fingernails? Huh? You know, the stuff you had analyzed. Oh, sure, sure. It was human flesh, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. The doc said it probably came from a man. You know, Santos, they can tell in five minutes who that man was. Who are you kidding? Okay, don't believe me. Sergeant? Wait a minute. Well, suppose I was in Doris' apartment. But were you or weren't you? Yeah. And you did fight with her? Yeah, I tried to keep her from committing suicide. Well, you couldn't have tried very hard. Well, I do the best I can remember. She showed me this afternoon. I'm still weak. Yeah, sure. Well, it may be news to you, Santos, but when people hang themselves, they customarily step off a height. And there was nothing resembling a chair in that bedroom. You're sure of that? Positive. You don't see a red leather vanity bench? You mean... Yeah. Looks like he's got you there, Mike. Remember, you were the one who commented on it. Yes, yeah, so I did. What did you take out of that bench, Santos? Don, you wish you knew. Maybe I can guess. Probably some evidence linking you with a couple of unsolved murders. Yes, it's all no good, Mike. You got to be able to prove it. Not if we can prove you killed Doris Webster. And take it from me, Santos, we can. All right, Sergeant, make like a cop. <laughs> I hope you're not bluffing this time, Mike. No, I'm not, Sergeant. Santos killed both Doris and Brian King. But that's what doesn't make sense. Why should he kill King? The guy was working for him. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, but Santos didn't believe he was working out right. King didn't approve of what Santos forced him to do to Stuart Van Dyne, and he was all for taking a powder. Well, you know Santos. The only time you quit his outfit is the way King did. Well, why did he kill Doris? He was tired of her horsing around. And he couldn't have been exactly crazy about whatever it was she was holding over his head. So he strung her up? That's right. And you're probably curious about how I figured that one out. No, no, no. We found Doris hanging three feet off the floor. Well, listen... And that uh... vanity bench Santa's claims she used was only 24 inches high. Now, you tell me how you can step off something two feet high and wind up three feet in the air. All right, if you saw it, why didn't you say something before? What, and spoil your fun? Don't forget, Mike, I'm a typical dumb cop who can't add two and two together without using his fingers. If I claimed I solved the crime, who'd ever believe me? Certainly no one who ever listened to a show called The Adventures of the Falcon. Good night, Sergeant. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Welcome back. It's been a while since we've heard Jackson back on the Falcon, and here he gets to play the heavy. I did find it interesting that the actor he sent Mandel Kramer's character to attack was named Van Dyne, as the pen name of the creator of Philo Vance was S.S. Van Dyne, and Beck played Vance over the radio for two years. I'm wondering, was that intentional, or was it like just a subconscious association by the writer? Given how rare the name Van Dyne is, it's kind of hard for me to think that it's a coincidence. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and I have this from Peter writing over on Spotify regarding the case of the Witty Widow. Sergeant Corbett was the star of the show this time, and I loved it. The police are usually portrayed as bumbling fools that can't keep up with private detectives, so this was a nice change-up from what we normally hear. Well, thanks for the comment, Peter. And I love Sergeant Corbett. I love his sarcasm, his wit, and of course, you kind of got a bit of the same sort of feel even though Mike solved the case at the end of today's episode and included one of the biggest fourth-wall-breaking winks you'll hear on any old-time radio detective story. And I do like the idea of the police being smart enough to handle things and competent police foils. If I had a problem with it at all on the Falcon, it's that it does seem a bit inconsistent, because on one hand, they'll go for the idea that Sergeant Corbett is a smart uh, police officer who is quite capable of solving cases, but then they'll have him make some really dumb mistakes. For example, in this episode going instinctively with suicide, and apparently the theory that before she committed suicide, she decided to tear apart her apartment. If you're going to have the idea that the police foil is smart, then have him not make really dumb deductions. And, you know, I don't think that this is something unheard of in the Golden Age of Radio. There were other programs that had smart police foils. For example, you had Lieutenant Riley in Let George Do It. And you had Lieutenant Brooks in the amazing Mr. Malone summer series with George Petrie. Or Jack Webb as Lieutenant Lefevre in the new adventures of Michael Shane. But that said, even though it doesn't make sense in light of some of the odder things that Corbett seems to miss, he is such a fun character. I'm happy when he does come up with something. I just wish that they would make him a little more consistently smart, but it's definitely an effort and... I give him credit for that. Then we also have a comment on YouTube, and this one comes from Jeff. And Jeff writes, Announcer Ed Herlihy continued as a radio and television announcer for many years, 
Also playing an announcer in movies such as Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Thanks, Jeff. That's something that I had missed and I'm really glad that you brought to my attention. And many of these figures in the golden age of radio definitely had some very long-lasting careers. And I'm always fascinated to find out about old-time radio stars that I encountered and never even knew it. Uh, I did actually see the very last movie that Ed Herlihy was in, which is the Woody Allen TV remake of Don't Drink the Water. But Pee-wee's Big Adventure was very big for me when I was growing up and we were traveling around the country. We were often in places where we didn't have TV reception or we didn't have cable. So my dad would record movies onto VHS whenever he had the opportunity. And we had several movies that we absolutely wore out watching because we couldn't get anything else. And Pee-wee's Big Adventure is one of those films that I had to have watched, you know, 15 times. So fascinating to learn about that connection. And Betsy comments regarding the case of the witty widow, I enjoyed this one. Well, thank you so much, Betsy. I appreciate your uh, comments. And also want to go ahead and thank... Alexis for giving a five-star rating to the case of the talented Texan over on Good Pods. Well, now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Haskell. Haskell has been one of our Patreon supporters since August 2015, currently supporting the podcast at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Haskell. And that will actually do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software and be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you're following us. We will be back next Monday with another adventure with the Falcon, but join us back here tomorrow for Bulldog Drummond where... Hello? Captain Drummond? Yes? Captain Drummond, I need your help. Who is this, He's going to kill me tonight. Who is this? Captain Drummond, you must hurry before it's too late. Hotel Blackton, room 21. Please hurry, I can... Hello? 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 Yeah? I was just talking... Got the wrong number, buddy. Now, look, just a moment. Hello? Hello? Denny? Denny? Yes, sir? Oh, good, good. You're still dressed. Get our hats quickly. Uh, What is it, sir? That telephone call. Yes, sir? We have an appointment at the Hotel Blackton. Oh, at this time of night. An appointment with whom, sir? An appointment with murder. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.